Members, please be seated. At this time, pursuant to SCR 3, we are ready to hear an address by the Governor. Madam Doorkeeper. Mr. Speaker, I have the First Lady of the State of Texas and the Governor of the State of Texas at the back door of the House. Please admit the Governor and the First Lady. It is my high honor and privilege to introduce the governor of the state of Texas, Rick Perry. Julie, thank you. Sipper Fi. Speaker Strauss, President Pro Tem Hinojosa, members of the legislature, thank you. I appreciate you for this one final opportunity to speak to you in the chamber where it all began 30 years ago last week. Now, I come here to reflect on what we have done together and to say farewell, but most of all, to tell you it has been the highest of honors to serve as your governor for the last 14 years. I believe in public service. I believe it is among the most honorable of callings. And I'm reminded of that every time I am with legislators. Some of who was here on the first day that I set foot on this floor, such as Speaker Craddock, who can't be with us here today, but my classmate Harold Dutton, John Smithy, Dean Whitmire, and the inimitable Miss Thompson. <laughs> I'm delighted to be joined with the woman who has been a steadfast influence on me all these many years, the one as true to this cause as a needle to the pole your first lady, and the love of my life, Anita Perry. Because of her example, and the example of so many legislators. I've always viewed public service as a worthy calling, a calling that President Lincoln summarized as doing the greatest good to the greatest number. Texas is a state where nothing is impossible, where the sons and daughters of migrant workers can aspire to own their own farm 
where the children of factory workers can build new age manufacturing facilities, where the son of a tenant farmer can become the governor of the greatest state in the nation. In Texas, it's not where you come from that matters. It's where you're going. Texas doesn't recognize the artificial barriers of race, or class, or creed. The most vivid dreams take flight from the most humble beginnings. And so it was for me. As many of you know, I grew up in a place called Paint Creek. When I was young, we didn't have electricity or running water. Mom bathed me and my sister in a number two wash tub out on the back porch. <laughs> we attended the Paint Creek Rural School, where some of the teachers literally lived on the campus. You see, their profession was literally their life. They inspired me. In fact, I'm proud to say that I graduated in the top 10 in my class. <laughs> That's right, 13 in that class, but <laughs> I can assure you, none of my teachers knew that they were instructing a future governor. But they also have a, a motto. They have a motto at Paint Creek School that summarizes the endless possibilities for its students. It says, no dream too tall for a school so small. And in this, the people's house. We're in the business of making dreams possible. Every dream counts. Every child matters. And in Texas, every child has a chance. That is the Texas that we have built together. A Texas of unlimited opportunity. There's a reason more people move to Texas than any other state. Because it is the best place in the world to find a job and to raise a family and to pursue your dreams. You know, in some respects, this has been true for a long time. Even in the early 1800s, Americans headed west, leaving their troubles. They wanted to look for that second chance. And when they got to Texas, they had reached the final frontier. They planted roots. They tamed this harsh land. They won a revolution. They founded a republic. And they survived droughts and wildfires and hurricanes, discovered crude, started great industries and universities, and took mankind to the moon. In my tenure alone, we've been tested by the disintegration of the space shuttle Challenger, by hurricanes Katrina and Rita and Ike, We've had devastating wildfires, the spread of Ebola, and a humanitarian crisis at the border. Each time, each time, Texans have responded to these tests with great character. As long as there has been a Texas, there has existed a people whose character has been refined by fire, whose souls are resilient, who respond to tragedy with grace who look to the future with hope. What we have done together is to preserve Texas as a land of opportunity, making our economy more diverse, jobs more plentiful. Now, the difference between the Great Recession of the last decade and the recession of the 1980s is that we have built a more diverse economy, able to survive even those inevitable slowdowns. Two times during my tenure as governor, we have faced major budget shortfalls. And both times we addressed those budget shortfalls without raising taxes. Today that rainy day fund is flush with billions in cash. And just think, that's only four years after a $27 billion budget shortfall. In addition to 
keeping with my philosophy that you don't spend all the money just because you can, I'm leaving the next governor with more than $100 million in unspent funds from trustee programs and other funds managed by my office. Our economy continues to be fueled by private sector innovation. Texas innovation gave the world spindle top at the turn of the century and hydraulic fracturing at the end of the century. Today, horizontal slant drilling is tapping oil and gas fields unreachable just a few years ago. This technology is a testament to the power of the private sector to drive economic change. But if you wonder whether leadership in a governor's office can impact economic growth, consider two states that share the Marcellus shell, Pennsylvania and New York. Pennsylvania is creating thousands of energy jobs by utilizing fracking to tap deep energy reserves. And on the other hand, New York Governor Andrew Cuomo recently announced a fracking ban. Two states, two vastly different approaches. One creates jobs. The other appeases a political base at the expense of the people. In Texas, we have chosen jobs. We have chosen energy security. And we will one day end America's dependence on hostile sources of foreign energy. But our success doesn't stop with traditional fuel sources. You can be proud that Texas produces more energy from wind turbines than all but five other countries. <laughs> We've expanded our economy while protecting our environment. Nitrogen oxide emissions are down by 62 percent. Sulfur dioxide emissions are down by more than 50 percent. Ozone levels down by 24 percent. And our carbon footprint has been reduced by 9 percent. You see, we don't accept the false choice that the president offers about projects like the Keystone Pipeline, between a clean environment and a strong economy. In Texas, we have protected the air that we breathe, the water we drink, the land that we farm, without declaring war on American industry. I've been. I've been guided by simple philosophy, that job creation, not higher taxation, is the best form of revenue generation. And we've created jobs. In the last year, we've created 441,000 jobs. Since I became governor, with your help, we have created almost one-third of all the nation's new jobs. The unemployment rate in Texas is significantly below the national average. And right here in Austin, Texas, it's below four percentage points. In fact, if you look at the last seven years, starting in December of 2007, you'll see that 1.4 million jobs were created in Texas. In that same period, the rest of the country lost 400,000 jobs. Our formula for success is simple. Keep the taxes low, implement smart regulations, provide an educated workforce, and stop lawsuit abuse at the courthouse. As you'll recall, with the election of the first Republican speaker since, uh, well, more than a century in 2003, and we did two things that set the tone for the next decade. Those of you who were here will recall we first refused to raise taxes in the face of a $10 billion shortfall. Instead, we cut spending, 
We enforced zero-based budgeting and we resisted the idea that Texans should pay more so government could cut less. And secondly, we passed the most sweeping lawsuit reforms in the nation, reforms that Dallas Federal Reserve President Richard Fisher has called the key to our economic growth. These reforms were controversial among those who wrote opinion columns and hired swarms of lobbyists, but it wasn't controversial for the trucker or the waitress, the farmer or the nurse, the quiet majority that feels overbilled, taxed to death. Those Texans can't demand a raise when revenue exceeds revenue and neither should government. While some still struggle in the shadows of opportunity, we've created tremendous possibilities for millions of Texans. While the rest of the nation has lost middle-class jobs, Texas has created them. In fact, Texas has created new jobs in every income category. The people who benefit from our economic policies are the young high school graduate, making six figures working in the oil fields. It's the small technology startup with access to software engineers. It's the line worker at Toyota and the engineer at SpaceX. With major investments in jobs come major investments in the cultural arts. Dallas is home to the Meyerson Symphony Center, the AT&T Performing Arts Center. The American Film Institute moved its headquarters from California to Dallas. The Nasher Sculpture Center relocated to Dallas in 2003. The Perot Museum of Nature and Science opened there in 2012. The largest cultural arts district in the country at 68 acres is in Dallas, Texas. Fort Worth home to a new museum of modern art, a revitalized Kimball Art Museum, and the Bass Performing Hall, all a part of the nation's third largest cultural district. And right here in Austin, we now have a museum of modern art, a performing arts facility, and the largest film and music festival in the world, as well as, I might add, the only Formula One race in the United States. And 75 miles south of here, Madam Secretary, in your hometown, San Antonio has that new performing arts facility. And tonight, in Houston, Texas, your hometown, Dean, there are more theater seats available anywhere this side of Broadway. This creative and cultural boom is not the product of a government grant program, but the result of your policies that have created a decade of economic expansion. As governor, I have made economic growth my signature initiative, but I recognize job creation is not the answer to every ill. In fact, in some respects, it's brought challenges to our state, straining our water resources, crowding our freeways, stressing our power grid. In recent years, we have taken action to protect our water supply and expand our roadways. But work remains to be done if Texas is to continue to lead the nation. Our success has also attracted millions of job seekers, not just from other states, but from other countries. You see, many attempt to reach our state by any means, legal or illegal. Even more troubling than the economic migrant who comes here illegally and the children who come here from Central America unaccompanied by their parents are the drug cartels, the transnational gangs that exploit their plight and threaten our citizens. Those who smuggle children enslave women, destroy lives by peddling illegal drugs and weapons, they are the face of evil. And we have not stood idly by.
We have not stood idly by against that threat. Texas has done more to secure the border than any other state in the nation. And as long as Washington will not secure the border, Texas will be more than up to the task. <laughs> 30 years ago, when I took the oath of office in that seat, I was a Democrat. Three sessions and a good many special sessions later, I became a Republican. That day, I made both political parties happy. <laughs> the one constant has been my belief in conservative ideas, that families know how to spend their money better than government. That Government must do a few things and do them well. And that Texans, uninhibited by overtaxation and excess regulation, can make the most of freedom. But many of our freedom, or excuse me, many of our citizens are not free today because they live with the chains of addiction. Over the years, I came to see our approach to non-violent drug offenders as flawed. And because of the leadership of Democrats and Republicans, we started to take a new approach. On the advice of a Democrat judge in Dallas, we created drug courts. We've created diversion programs that treat alcoholism and drug addiction as a disease and not a moral failing. And because of these changes in policy, we've been able to shut down three prisons, repeat offenses by drug offenders are down, and the lowest crime rate in this state since 1968. <laughs> of those imprisoned because of addiction, I think of the words of the 20th century social activist who co-founded Volunteers for America, Maud Ballington Booth. She said, there is a sunshine that can force its way through prison bars and work wondrous and unexpected miracles and a genuine change of heart where results seem the most utterly unlikely and impossible. My fellow Texans, we must remember when it comes to the disease of addiction, the issue is not helping bad people become good, but sick people become well. Turning to diversion programs hadn't made us soft on crime. It's made us smart on crime. There is not a single accomplishment. There is not a single accomplishment I have spoken of today that occurred without bipartisan support. I believe we are at our best when we get beyond our differences and attempt to seek common ground. I speak to members of my own party in asking that you do not place purity ahead of unity. Ronald Reagan knew that someone who agreed with you 80% of the time was not your enemy, but your friend. There's room for different voices, for disagreement, Compromise is not a dirty word if it moves Texas forward. If members of this body will work across party lines, put Texas first, I believe the best is yet to come. I couldn't pick 
a better successor as governor than Greg Abbott. And he couldn't have two better partners to lead this state than Dan Patrick and Joe Strauss. As I bid farewell, I know the future's in good hands. And I'm confident that Texas will remain the best place to start a business, to find a job, and realize one's God-given potential. We are the new frontier of freedom and opportunity, a state whose landscape glitters with millions of dreams, big and small. I'm proud to call Texas my home, humble to have stood in her service for the last 30 years and ever optimistic of what she will become in the years ahead. I leave you with this. Be true to Texas always, and she will be true to you. Good luck, Godspeed, God bless you, and through you may God continue to bless the great state of Texas.